All right, we're live. So welcome back to Dapp University. So today we're talking about something that's a pretty big deal for Bitcoin and the entire crypto space on the whole. And we're going to look at that. We're going to check on the entire markets today. And also uh, a lot of news has happened since our live stream that we did yesterday. Of course, we do these every Monday through Friday here in this channel. Make sure you subscribe and turn on the notifications down below to find out about those whenever we go live. So you know, before we get into that, you know, if you're new around here, I'm Gregory. And on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you learn how to become a blockchain master step by step start to finish then head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today all right so we got uh people jumping in the chat here we'll let everybody kind of roll in before we uh uh do our normal greetings here and kind of switch up our live stream time a little bit so i think uh people are a little bit confused here so let's jump into the first big uh, item of news here today so something that's been kind of people have been waiting around for for a long time is the possibility of a bitcoin etf being approved in the united states all right so what is that if you're not if you just if you're just new and you don't know what that is and why it's a big deal so um an etf is basically an exchange traded fund so this is a way for people in the traditional financial system to get exposure to crypto related products um through a traditional exchange without actually holding the cryptocurrency itself okay so that's not just exclusive for cryptocurrencies this has happened with other products in the past like gold for example we're actually gonna look at what happened uh to gold whenever an etf was approved is actually a pretty big deal in the price of gold over time that's one of the reasons it's such a big deal for uh bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general so yesterday we got uh some pretty big news that let me just pull up my screen here. So Kathy Woods, ARK Invest, uh, files to create a Bitcoin ETF under the symbol uh, ARKB. All right. So um, we're going to why this is such a big deal, but just really quickly, we got people jumping in the chat here. We got Kristen, we got Susanna, we got Harry Fox, uh, Michael, Gustavo, Mark, Culture Hives. Awesome. Welcome. So uh, let's let's jump back in here. So why is this important? Well, like I said, we've had several Bitcoin ETF applications uh, happen, and we can see the SEC last week, again, had postponed a decision to approve the first one. So again, this is just um, an application. It's not actual official approval, but we're, we're waiting on something like this to basically uh, pass. And the greater sort of like critical mass, these type of things that we have come into play, we have key players like Kathy Wood, who's been a longtime Bitcoin bull, really famous uh, in the space. Um, who's gotten exposure to other products like uh, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust and others. I really think it's just a matter of time before we see something like this actually gain approval. As Bitcoin takes off more and more, as we see it sort of becoming friendlier to traditional finance and also uh, friendlier with regulations, I think it's just a matter of time before we see something like this pass. And so we can see what happened actually with other uh, products that launched ETFs in the past compared to the price before. So one example is gold. This is something that's got really people really excited. They watched what happened with gold's performance uh, after an ETF was actually approved. Uh, and they, they, you know, are, are hoping that a similar type of thing can happen for Bitcoin because ultimately it gives the asset le more legitimacy. It gives, it gives more people exposure without having to, you know, enter into the crypto ecosystem and jump through all the hoops uh, that they have to do. You know, do you think about it? If you, if you go register for a crypto exchange you have to kyc you have to do all this stuff type of stuff if you want to participate in DeFi, you know you have to get a external wallet you have to do all this type of stuff but if if you can basically give people the tools to participate at least in uh you know owning bitcoin with the tools they already use um and people who are already you know basically ha have some capabilities in, in terms of finance then that's a huge deal so you, you instantly broaden the market for people who can buy bitcoin in the first place and when you give it the legitimacy of offering it in products they already know and use that's huge so what's the happened with the gold etfs uh, so this is actually an article uh from a long time ago see it's from 2013 on market watch but you can actually see what happened with the uh price of gold let me just see here let me pull up the chart let me see so this was the price of gold over time. All right, and you can see that the first ETS were launched in like, I think it was like 2003, the article says here. Um, and you can see basically, you know, gold's on this massive bull run uh, throughout this time. Okay, so you, you could definitely talk about other factors in play uh, with the performance of that asset, but it's at least the view of lots of other people and also this article that the ETS had a, had a major role in that. So basically... We can certainly track the growth of gold ETFs since their invention and see how investors' interest in gold has grown significantly, said Will Rind. 
Um, so basically, there were, at this time writing this article, there are 143 gold TS available. Uh, the latest data showing asset center management at 132 billion. At the end of 2003, asset center management was just about uh, 191,000 uh, ETF securities data show. And then basically, the first gold uh, ETF in the United States, let's just see here. Uh, yeah, in the United States was SPDR Gold Trust, all right, in 2004. So basically, between 2003 and 2004, we had a pretty big wave of gold ETFs uh, come onto the scene. And basically, you can see what happened to the price of gold <laughs> during that time. Now, again, you could also argue that there are other factors that were uh, contributed to this. But lots of people um, draw conclusions that, you know, the ETF has a major, major role in this. And that's that's what they are hopeful for with approval of a Bitcoin ETF and the overall crypto space on the whole. And we've got another, uh, you know, entity throwing their name in the hat for being the first person to get that ETF approval. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of people who are kind of backing, backing this and are pretty excited. So let me know what you think down in the chat below. Do you think gold ETF is actually important? There are some people that say the crypto ecosystem is so mature that it, the ETF approval doesn't really matter as much at this point. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below, down in the chat section below. So you got other people jumping in the chat here. We got uh, Jeremy, Dan, Kevin, NSJ, uh, Dick Jam, uh norbert bd tom welcome welcome so let's actually go ahead and jump in to the bitcoin price here and other cryptocurrencies and kind of just check on what's uh happening in the markets today so let me pull up my price chart here so things are looking like kind of bullish on the short term i think at the very least it's a little bit of encouragement uh from some of the <laughs> kind of kind of gross price action we've seen over the past several days or so, especially this past weekend. Uh, but let's actually look at what's going on with Bitcoin. All right, so I'm going to pull up the Bitcoin chart here. So let's start with Bitcoin here. So you know, we're currently trading at $36,202. So again, we've been in this kind of range for a while. It's kind of somewhat bearish range uh, that's kind of gone between 30,000, 40,000. Of course, we drop below 30,000 a little bit on some of these wicks. Some would say that that's just, you know, just the wicks. But if you actually look at the majority of the prices, we've kind of been in between those two big numbers. And somewhat bearish, right? But generally speaking, just kind of a range here. Um, so... One bullish thing to see here on the short term, at least, is that we have broken above this uh, this moving average, this 20-day moving average. So we have a candle that's body that's forming above that. All right. Uh, of course, we broke above it here a couple times, and that didn't necessarily mean anything long term. We we you know we got above it here and then <laughs> followed by some red candles. But hey, we'll take it. All right. What I would like to see is definitely get back above these other moving averages, like the 50-day moving average and ultimately the 200-day moving average uh, before we get too excited. Of course, we need to get up into the 40,000s for both of those things to take place. Now, if it takes, if, you know, if we do that over the next 30 days or so, of course, this 200-day this, uh, moving average is going to come down and it would be easier to do that. So we could see some more consolidation um, over that period of time. So let me know what you think down in the comment section below. Are we going to chop? Are we going to leg down further? <laughs> Are we going to immediately have a V-shaped recovery? Uh, let me know what you think down below. So let's take a look at the Ether price as well, because that's one I'm pretty excited about. Um, you know, Ether has been performing well the past several days. Of course, it you know, dumped before that. But let's take a look here. So Ether, we're trading at uh, $2,218. So we got four green candles in a row on ether that's pretty awesome um you know we are again getting above these 20 day moving averages here um you know we're firmly above the 200 day on ether um again it's one of those type of things where i'd like to see us move above uh all moving averages <laughs> to to get too excited before we see a, a trend upward here because we're still about 50 percent down from our all-time highs but in the short term yeah this this is encouraging. <laughs> We're not just seeing like a massive you know dump downward. Now of course a lot of people are gonna say, hey, this is just like, uh, it's a trap. It's basically people trying to get liquidity so they can exit before the bigger dump. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, but short term, you know, if if you're doing like short term trades, then <laughs> you know you've been long in this stuff. Then that's also also good. So let's see here. Um, let's actually check on the ETH to BTC ratio because I know some people are excited about the possibility of ETH kind of stealing the show here for a while. Uh, I'm a little skeptical of it, to tell you the truth. Um, I think, I mean, I would love to be proven wrong, but I have a pretty good feeling that 
Bitcoin's kind of leading the show right now in terms of I don't think we're just going to see like ETH like just rip off the new all time highs if Bitcoin's kind of uh, trying to figure out what it wants to do. I'm I, I still think we're in that phase where Bitcoin is king and uh, it's pretty good index of what's happening in the overall crypto markets. Um, in the sense of like, I don't think Bitcoin's just going to like, you know, range or go down and then we see ETH just blast off. I, I think there can be a day when, you know, ETH, uh, steals the show. Like we talk about that a lot in this channel with flipping, uh, can ETH flipping Bitcoin in terms of market cap and actually become the number one in cryptocurrency by market cap. I think it is possible. Um, but I would be very surprised if we saw it happen like, you know, now. <laughs> So let's take a look at the ETH to BTC ratio, actually. So this just measures the Ethereum price to the Bitcoin price. And we can see this uh, trend forming upward here. We've got another green candle on this. Okay, we can take these moving averages off. They're not quite as important for this particular thing here. Yeah, we can see that moving up. We're at uh, 0 0.06. You can actually calculate uh, when a flipping would happen based on this ratio i believe it's uh 0 0.16 you can actually check it ratiogang.com it'll show you uh the point at which ETH would flip in bitcoin by market cap so here it's a 0 0.16 yeah that, that's when a flipping would happen we're sure still at 0 0.06 so a long way to go before ETH flip in bitcoin by market cap so let me know what you think down in the comment section below is uh bitcoin still leading the show or can ETH take over let me know what you think down below. All right, so let's uh, look at another pretty crazy... Uh, let's actually look at a couple other metrics before we get in some other news stories since yesterday. I actually want to look at some on-chain metrics. So we look at the prices. We've seen what's going on with these exchanges. But let's look at um, some on-chain metrics because we haven't checked on those in a while. So I'm going to pull up Glassnode. And, uh, you know, when the market was getting frothy, we were really looking for, you know, top indicators. Okay, so we were, um, you know, we were pretty try trying to figure out how frothy the market was. We're looking at a lot of top indicators like the Nuple chart. So we can actually look at some bottom indicators now um, and see, like, you know, have prices reach bottoms. You know, we were, earlier before, we were kind of checking, like, half prices reach tops, and now we're checking on half prices reach bottoms. So one... Um, one metric people use to check on this is the, uh, I believe it's called the Puel multiple. Again, some of these pronunciations are a little, little challenging to get right. I've heard people say it different ways. Um, but the big picture with this metric here is, um, you know, in the past, when you see things kind of getting, you know, going deep into the green is where bottoms tend to form. Okay. So again, with some of these on-chain metrics, you kind of have to take them with a grain of salt. They're not all necessarily perfect indicators of what's going on, what's going to happen. Because if we do enter into some sort of long-term, you know, uh, bear trend, then we never quite hit euphoria in terms of uh, the Nuple metric with Bitcoin. We kissed it uh, once. So, like I said, none of these metrics are perfect in and of themselves. You have to kind of look at lots of different things and uh, from multiple angles. But if you take this metric as any indication, then that could mean that we're either at a bottom or close to a bottom. Now, if you you know read into these metrics even more, uh, you can see that some of the times when we just start to get into the green, it takes a long time before we actually go deep into the green. Okay, and similarly, you know you can see we like kissed green here, all right, and then it took time for for those things to to happen. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean. Uh, that that we're just gonna like rock into a v-shaped recovery but if you use this indicator um and if it's held true in the past and it has any bearing on reality now it, it could mean that we're close to that so uh another on-chain metric we're talking about you know the flipping um one 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 reason people think that the flipping is inevitable in terms of ETH flipping Bitcoin is because it's already flipped it by so many other metrics, you know, by, you know, um, basically fees paid to the network, all that type of stuff, transactions per day. But we saw something pretty big happen yesterday. Um, so basically, a historic day for the first time, uh, ETH address activity is above Bitcoin address activity. <laughs> okay, this is pretty big. So let me just pull, this is from Santiment. So this is a, a great cryptocurrency data service. You definitely go check that out if you haven't already. Uh, so anyways, ETH address activity surpasses Bitcoins for the first time in crypto history. All right, so you can see the active addresses for 24 hours. Okay, and we can see this flipping here. 
So um, let's take a look at a couple other pieces of news that have happened since yesterday that I think are that you all are going to be excited about. So we talked about, you know, the Bitcoin ETFs and, um, you know, other. You know, there's kind of a mixture of views in the Bitcoin ETF. Some people think it's going to be huge uh, for Bitcoin because of, like I said, it gives people in traditional financial system exposure to, um, you know, crypto without having to go through the crypto way of doing it, basically. Um, because legitimacy crypto, some people say that, hey, they're not as important because we have all the other means for traditional financial people to do that, like these other funds, like these trusts, etc. So yesterday we did see this come up where Morgan Stanley now owns 2,000, or sorry, yeah, 28,200 shares of grayscale Bitcoin trusts, all right, showing more signs of uh, institutional crypto investments. So is this the new normal? So basically, yeah, the grayscale Bitcoin trust is a product we've talked about a lot on this channel. Um, it, has a, it plays a pretty big deal in what's going on with the overall crypto markets, but it also gives people like this a way to purchase large amounts of Bitcoin um, and we, like I said, we see this trend of institutions buying cryptocurrency for their balance sheet. And now we have a major bank, you know, Morgan Stanley open, owning 28,200 uh, shares of Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Okay. So this is huge. And we talked about Tesla buying $1.5 billion of Bitcoin for its balance sheet earlier this year. Uh, seeing this trend of more and more uh, institutions, companies, publicly traded companies doing this type of thing. Um, and I don't think this is a trend that just evaporated even though you know the bitcoin price happened to fall by roughly 50 percent over the past couple months okay um one thing that's also really important to understand is you know we're, we're ending uh quarter two of 2021 and we're probably going to see more earnings reports come out and we're probably going to see more people uh who have purchased cryptocurrency to hold it on their balance sheet okay so we'll see we'll see if that prediction comes true but here's one example of where it has come true already <laughs> so what do y'all think down in the chat below <laughs> so let's see flipping love it yep fundamentally getting bigger yep 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 All right, so let's take a look at, um, we do have some, um, let's just see here. We do have some clarity from the Fed, all right, about stable coins. We saw this come up yesterday. Um, so I actually can't pull up the article perfectly on my computer because it's got one of those kind of annoying uh, paywalls for, for the news site, but I'll just look at Bloomberg's Twitter. I can't go through the entire article, like I said, because I can't click on it, <laughs> but uh, it's from Bloomberg. So key Fed official quarrels uh, sounds very bullish on stable coins, okay? So this is a big deal um, because people are kind of wondering what's the Fed's official stance on crypto? What is their official stance on stable coins? All that type of stuff. We've talked a lot on this channel about central bank digital currencies or CBDCs um, as something that, you know, is a growing trend among uh, just Western nations. OK, uh, well, not just Western nations, actually, really, it's a global trend. So is the Fed going to throw their name in that hat? So there's there's a lot of details on that in this article. You can definitely go check that out. Again, I've it won't let me click on it. I have to sit here and like turn a VPN or, on or something to uh, whitelist my IP address, and it's kind of annoying. But um, I'll just put this link in the chat if you want to go check on it uh, because I can't pull it, fully pull it up on my screen here and go through it um, live on the chat here. So just go check out the the chat replay for a link to this if you want to go read it yourself. So um, a couple of things I also want to bring up are some pretty exciting launches that have been announced and they just came up as of yesterday. Okay. So the first one, these, these are new, these are new products um, in blockchain, especially on the DeFi side of things. So one of them uh, is very similar to a lot of the use cases I've talked about a ton on this channel. Okay. So Let's pull this up here. Compound finance to launch DeFi treasury for institutions. All right. So what is this? Well, if you've seen if you've seen any of my videos where I talk about compound finance, so this is a decentralized app, a DeFi app that's powered by smart contracts. It's a savings and lending app. Okay. You can go to the website with a cryptocurrency wallet. You can deposit money into it. A lot of times it's just stable coins. 
or other cryptos and take out loans on the other side. It works a lot like a bank. So basically, you could take stable cryptocurrency there and earn competitive interest rates way better than you could in your bank, okay? Um, I mean, sometimes up like 10%. So that's because people are taking loans out on the other side and they're automating away a lot of the middleman, a lot of the fat inside of there. So yesterday we saw an announcement that Compound is launching uh, a DeFi treasury for institutions. Okay, so why is this important? Well, I've talked a lot about how I think savings lending is such a big deal. It's a killer app for blockchain technology because, you know, you can get benefits you can't get somewhere else, like high yield, all right? But there's a problem with it. Um, you know, there's a lot of hoops that you have to jump through in order to do that. Uh, you have to, you know, use a wallet. You have to go to a cryptocurrency exchange. And if you're an institution, like, you're probably not going to do all that, especially if you're talking about large amounts of money. Um, you know, if somebody wants to like take $10 million or a hundred million dollars, whatever it is. Um, there are some people who do this, but many institutions aren't going to just like get a MetaMask wallet and start, you know, uh, uh, depositing into compound through that way. Okay. So what we're seeing here is compound finance actually opening up, um, a, uh, a product for institutions to do this. And my understanding of this, and you can correct me if I'm wrong down in the comment section below, is it looks like a situation where it's like basically traditional finance up front and then DeFi in the back. Okay. So traditional finance in the front end in the sense of clients simply transfer USD into their compound treasury account and instantly gain access to interest rates of 4%. Okay. So this is orders of magnitude higher than any high street bank can offer on dollar savings accounts. So... Um, this is like a situation where essentially you register online, you have a traditional account with like a username and password, looks like online banking, and then essentially you transfer your funds into there, you just wire in actual dollars, you know, no, don't convert it into crypto, but then you can get this benefit of 4% on your actual cash. And I've talked about this for a long time that I think this is where this is headed, to where I think the average Joe, and I'm talking about, not talking about institutions being average Joes here, but the average Joe does not necessarily want to, you know, install a crypto wallet and like go through. The, all the hoops of participating in DeFi, I think where we're headed long term, or not just average Joe, think about like, you know, your grandmother or something who's gotten used to online banking maybe over time, uh, but they don't want to learn the type of thing. So basically, if you could have an online banking website where you do a lot of the similar types of things, but it does crypto on the back end, there's still a significant amount of automation here. Um, where they can get the benefit of crypto without really being in crypto. And then the business who does DeFi in the back end takes a cut of that fee in order to give them that benefit. All right. But they can still use this leverage of, of crypto to, to help with that. And that's, that's what this looks like here. Okay. So I haven't deep dived into this quite as much as I would like to, but that's my initial impression of this. If I'm wrong, let me know down in the comment section below. Um, but like I said, this is where I see it see things headed. I've been talking about this for, you know, months, maybe even years now on this channel about that particular vision. And uh, yeah, it looks like what Compound's doing, and especially on the institutional level. So they're combining two things. They're talking about this institutional adoption of blockchain technology and cryptocurrency, this theme we've talked about tons and tons on this channel, and also how I've talked about savings lending being a killer app for blockchain technology. Both of those two things combined is, looks like what we're seeing here. And also the user experience I've described almost word for word in some of these past videos. So let me know what y'all think down in the, in the chat section below. Somebody says, oh, it sounds overly centralized. Yeah, I definitely get that. But here's the vision for the future. Um, I think it's inevitable that we're going to see, like decentralization is a sliding spectrum where you're going to have things that are as decentralized as possible. I mean, I think Bitcoin is a case where you're probably going to be as decentralized as possible, but there's trade-offs. There's not really a lot that you can do with Bitcoin, okay? Uh, it's also slow. It's not super, super scalable, right? So if you slide that over to the other side, you can make every problem easier by introducing centralization. You know what I mean? You can always make things faster. You can make things easier. You can make things cheaper with centralization. Okay. Um, but if you kind of find somewhere in the middle where you get the best trade off that you can, that's probably where the sweet spot is. And I think what you really, I think the best of all worlds is giving people options. Okay. So if you want to do things as decentralized as possible, as long as we keep those options on the table for people who want that, I'm okay with that because, you know, I just don't want regulations to come into play where they say, well, you can't do things as decentralized as possible. Now you have to use these like centralized custodians. So let them, my whole thing is like, 
like let the market decide. If people want to use centralized custodians and they're well aware of the risks, uh, that type of thing, then well, by all means, let's let's make those options available because those centralized custodians are still hooking into decentralized finance on the back end. We still have massive DeFi users. They're just acting really on behalf of all these other users in an aggregated form. Okay, so. I'm still okay with that. I think that's all good for crypto long term, as long as people ha still have the choice of what they want to use and they understand the risks and that there's, you know, uh, honest marketing on the front end that, that, you know, lets people know what they're getting into when they use those products. So let's see here. Um, so comp versus Ave, and they're both awesome projects for sure. So let's look at another uh, launch that was announced yesterday. So we have an, another announcement from Polygon yesterday. So Polygon is extremely excited to announce Avail, all right, an important component of a completely new way on how future blockchains will work. So Avail is a general purpose, scalable data availability focused blockchain targeted uh, for standalone chains, side chains, and off chain scaling solutions. So the Polygon team has been, you know, just on fire lately. Um, you know, they've gotten a ton of traction with their uh, Matic scaling solution, uh, the side chain for Ethereum. Uh, we talked about Polygon a lot in this channel about how they're pursuing a variety of scaling solutions, and this looks like it's the next, um, you know, step forward in in their playbook. So, um, this has a lot of stuff, and I'm actually I read this yesterday, and I'm kind of going back and trying to understand it more so I can give you guys a pretty good explanation on it. I'm probably gonna make a standalone video about this on my channel, so if you want to, you know, watch out for that, click the like button down below, subscribe, turn on notifications, you can find out about that when it comes out. But uh, we can see some high level, you know, overview here. So it provides robust data availability layer by using an extremely secure mathematical primitive, uh, DA checks to erasure codes. Um, let's see here. So there's, there's a lot of like <laughs> technical speak, but let's look at the benefits. So basically, um, it's pretty big benefits here on data availability. All right, so there's a lot of technical speak that it's going to take me some time to sit down and actually distill this into a uh, pretty easily to uh, an easy to consume explanation of how this works. So check out, I'll, I'll come up, I'll come up with a, a standalone video that will give that for you guys, but uh, high level, I think this is probably good for the Polygon ecosystem. So somebody says, uh, with Israel building their digital shekel on the ETH blockchain, will they have to hold ETH in their reserve similar to El Salvador's? That's a good question. Um, I don't think that's the case, okay? So the digital shekel project that I talked about on this channel, um, so, you know, that, of course, is a is, it's like an early experiment, right? So we're not talking about, like, Israel is just for sure going <laughs> to convert the shekel to digital form forever and they're going to use ETH. This is a pilot project, it looks like, uh, to test this out. So my, we don't have a ton of details in the implementation of this, okay, to tell you the truth. Uh, but if I were to speculate on how this would work, um, I don't think it would require them to hold ETH because I don't think it's going to be ETH-backed shekel. I think it's going to be a shekel-backed, uh, you know, stable coin, basically, pegged to shekel. So, um, I mean, they would probably have to hold some ETH in order to uh, pay gas fees for any sort of, you know, central transactions done to implement this. Um, and, you know, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on the implementation. So if they're transferring uh, shekels internally without end users paying gas fees, but then they hold ETH in order to actually uh, do the transfers in some sort of centralized way, then that's very possible that they could have to hold ETH in that situation. It really just depends on how they implement it. And we don't have a ton of clear details on that, but I don't think it's the type of thing like we see with El Salvador where they they bought I can't remember the number, some large amount of Bitcoin and then like airdropped a bunch of it into people's wallets uh, to sort of seed, you know, the, the program. So we'll see. So this is EIP 1559 part of ETH 2.0. Uh, it is not part of ETH 2.0. 
it's just a it's just an improvement proposal for Ethereum that's been hanging out for a very long time. Um, and it's just coincidentally going to be implemented uh, as a part of ETH 1.0 before ETH 2.0 fully rolls out. All right, everybody. So that's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so the more people can learn about blockchain. You know, if you're as fascinated with this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? You can get my YouTube homepage. You can find my free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a massive shortcut entirely, you know, I can show you to become a blockchain master step by step from start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You know, you don't have to be an expert to get started today. To help people with zero coding experience experience become real world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.